At some point or another, most young artists that I know have considered that they would want to design characters for video games or possibly even animation. But that begs the question, what makes good character design? I'm Trent Kanuga. I've been a concept artist. I've been a character designer uh, for video games and comic books for almost my entire life. I mean, I live and breathe this stuff. And I wanna to try to answer this question through a series of videos. I'm calling this series the Character Designer's Toolkit, and it's gonna be pretty in depth. And today we're gonna to be taking a look at Final Fantasy VII. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about how the characters have evolved a little bit from the original Final Fantasy VII all the way up until Remake. I'm going to be breaking down elements of the character designs that work and elements of the character designs that I, I might have a disagreement with and that may cause confusion in the player even. Now, when you first do, uh, let's say you were to do a Google search for concept art for Final Fantasy VII, you're gonna find a lot of images that look like this. And uh, they're beautiful. You're gonna see even, maybe even you might see some 3D renders and they're going to be labeled as concept art. And this is entirely 100% false. It is something that people will click on and because of that, the algorithm in Google will say, oh, this is what people want when they click on or when they do a search for those words. But this is not actually concept art. This is promotional art. And it is art that is done long after a character design is done. It's sometimes done by an outsourced artist or somebody that doesn't work at the studio, but that artist seldom really gets to sign that work. In this case, almost all of uh, the character designs for Final Fantasy VII and Remake were done by a man named Tetsuya Nomura. At least that's who's credited for it. It's sometimes many different people. In this case, Tetsuya Nomura is generally credited for all character design in the Final Fantasy VII series of games. And his artwork looks like this. Now seeing character design drawings that look like this, probably this is gonna be very confusing to a budding concept artist, for example. Somebody who hasn't seen a lot of modern day uh, concept art might go, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's, that's what the characters look like because in game, they look like this. I mean, it was a different era and quite honestly, an awesome time to be a game developer, by the way. I started in 2002, and we could still get away with just doing cool, like, sketches on paper. Uh, but now this is no longer would this work if you had stuff like this in your portfolio. No way, no way, no way would that work. But for its time, it worked pretty well because of the limitations of the technology. So digging into the character design of Cloud Strife, first of all, first and foremost, we've got a very unique uh, kind of a hairstyle. Now, when I say unique, I mean unique for its time. You know, uh, this is 1997, 1998, roughly. And at the time, you you do have a little bit of like, you know, there's Astro Boy influence here. There's Mega Man influence here. This was right around the same time that Mega Man Legends was being developed. And you can see some consistencies in the kind of a taste and the style that was happening at, at the time. You had the, the big feet. This was a big thing that happened in the 90s. And believe me, I'm no stranger to the big feet thing, man. I was doing the same thing with my indie comic Creed at the time. The, uh, the big hands and the big stylized head. Now, the reason why they had these, these blown out proportions was because we were coming out of the 16-bit era. And in the 16-bit graphics, if you wanted to have characters emote uh, or have facial expressions, you had to make their heads bigger. And so this, this kind of logic carried over when we got into the PlayStation 1 era and we started to do these still what they called chibi style characters. Do people still use this word? It was a very common word to describe this style of graphics, the proportions on characters. And so Cloud Strife being, you know, a chibi version of him had the big googly eyes and had the big spiky hair. And because that stood out, it gave him a unique silhouette compared to the other characters in the series. And you really, when you're a character designer, you do want to really showcase how every character is so distinctly unique. And you'll see as we dig into other characters, how unique they get. And uh, some of them that stand out as more iconic and memorable because they are so unique. Now, this is uh, when Cloud uh, dresses up as a woman for one sequence that happens in the story to get into Don Corneo's, um well, let's just say he's a pervert and he, he only lets women into his, his place. So you've got to sneak in to save your friend. So it's, basically Cloud goes into disguise. And this is pretty generic. I mean, these are not, you know, 
overly detailed because you don't need to. Back in the the uh, old days, back with the old PS1 level of graphics, you didn't need to have like elegant, you know, pattern work type of materials. I'm not, this is not even, I'm not even trying to design here, but you didn't have to work out the details on the patterns of the dresses or outfits or things like that. Because quite frankly, the, uh, they were vector colored. The vectors were colored uh, in the polygons themselves. They didn't even have textures on a lot of them. There was no UVs for a lot of the graphics, the textures on these characters. So that's why those, those graphics, it could have been on the N64. And they did that a lot in the N64 level of graphics as well, where it was just a flat color. Uh, the, the polygon itself is colored. So there was no point to designing things like a belt buckle or like, you know, satchels or, or even defining, you know, more details on the character's design. Now, this is, to be fair, there were multiple versions, multiple models for each character. And uh, to explain a little bit further, there are other images specifically of Cloud Strife. So, for example, when the player goes into battle, uh, you would see a more detailed version of the character with a little bit, just slightly more realistic proportions, not realistic, but slightly more um, upright and less chibi proportions. And so these drawings had to be done to explain what all that stuff meant in the chibi version. And so here's where we get to see the metal rivets on Cloud's arm. Uh, we get to see that there's cloth bandaging and his design, technically speaking, has not changed much since this, even as they went into the remake, the design itself is pretty much one-to-one -one the same. You've got the belt buckle that all soldiers wear. This is a, a generally a consistent costume design across all soldiers for Shinra. Soldier is a, um, it's a elite unit of uh, materia enhanced soldiers, uh, fighters for Shinra. And Cloud Strife was one of them. If you haven't played this game, the story is enough of a reason to play it. Absolutely incredible. Great story. Um, it has some really cheesy moments, but ultimately play remake. It's very, very good. Um, and I think you can get it on discount. Anyway, by the way, how amazing would it be if you could do drawings like this and then uh, some awesome 3D modeler comes in and turns it into this? I mean, and then you get credit for the character design? Damn. So you see how the, the spiky hair translates pretty well. They had a few more polygons in these more upright versions, so you could get away with having a little bit more detail in your character designs. And the reason for this is obviously, as I said, the camera zooms in more. We're no longer in like the world map view. So we get to see the characters a little bit more up close, but in the battle system, we never need to see their emotion. We don't need to see them expressing uh, uh, sorrow or uh, sobbing or the most we're looking at is body language. How are they engaging in combat? So you might have a character who is asleep, uh, gets cast a spell on them, they fall asleep or something like that. that. That's That happens in the motion of the body, but it doesn't happen. In, you're not seeing a lot of drama happening. And, and drama is a big part of the uh, Final Fantasy, uh, just the series formula. It's very, it plays out like a Shakespearean play, almost all of them, except for 13. I won't go into that. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so what we do get to see here is a little bit more detail, like the, the belt buckles, again, also very consistent with the rest of the designs for soldiers. Uh, I think that this is strange because I think this must have been an early design because his pants definitely had much more of this kind of like uh, thing going on as you can see here this one is probably more accurate to how he looks in the game than say this this tall one also uh, the buster sword changed in design and uh, you can definitely see that it was worked out through these shots so what does all this stuff mean let's let's break down the actual a little bit more of the details of the designs so the leather leather gloves imply that this is a character who is he's a combat ready soldier obviously uh, he's got a uh, exposed muscles, usually with masculine type of characters, you want to have something where you're showing that they're probably going to be sweating. They're not like fighting in the tundra or something like that. These soldiers might be fighting in the desert, for example, you know, um, he's got these straps that are kind of holding up uh, his, his belt. And this belt almost looks like a weightlifting belt of sorts. And so like there's representation of 
things that are familiar to our world that subconsciously kind of communicate a little bit of things that, that might be going on uh, with this character. The, uh, the rivets in the arm, uh, the, the pauldron here. Now, I don't know when this first appeared. I don't know where it happened first. But what really works well about doing it on Cloud Strife is that it gives us a sense that possibly he is from a rugged steampunk kind of an influenced world. And when you couple this with seeing things like massive pipes sticking out of the city, the towers, we see a high tech kind of a society, but it's still using an almost steampunk inspired kind of shape language and materials and constructions. And so all, well, although what we find out later is that it's not steam, it's in fact, um, Mako energy. And that is like an energy of the earth of the world. That's that green stuff you see everywhere. But by tying in the kind of construction that we see in the world to the kind of dressing that a soldier for Shinra company would be wearing, which is basically almost like a private military, uh, we've kind of made this subconscious connection. And then, of course, what we don't see in this is that he has materia-infused eyes. Now, you do see that in the color images. His boots are pretty plain. His The rest of his uniform is actually pretty plain. But we're told that he is a soldier, that that he's just part of the unit. So it, it doesn't need to look like a completely unique... He wouldn't have a distinct element you know, of personality on his garb because it's, it is literally a uniform. It is something that a thousand of these Shinra soldiers are going to be seen wearing. In fact, we see other Shinra soldiers wearing the same damn thing. The most unique element about this character, one, of course, Buster Sword. Massive sword that's just way too big for this guy, right? Too big for this dude. Identifiably unique and interesting. Absolutely. It's asymmetry. One arm is exposed so that he's possibly, I don't know if maybe he needed more protection on one arm. I'm surprised he didn't give him some kind of like a plating or something on here, but it works really well that it's not there. Uh, the asymmetry of having the one shoulder, which is ironic that the blade is, it's really broken. It's not resting on his shoulder. Let's, we're not looking at the drawing. We're just looking at the design. Okay. Um, but also, also the most key, key, the most clutch aspect of this character design crazy spiked out iconic hair. No other soldier at Shinra has this hair. They all wear generic looking helmets. They might be wearing the same gear, but they none of them get to expose a crazy ass sharp as hell do like Cloud Strife does. Except for possibly Zack. Now Zack happened to be Cloud's mentor and Zack, he did have a crazy ass spiked out do but it was a different kind of spike. So we immediately kind of go, oh, different guy. Also, dark hair. Now, when you're working with something that doesn't have as much detail in it, like for example, a PS1 game uh, from 1997, you really have to do dramatic shifts between characters, dramatic silhouette shape differences and dramatic color differences. So if you've got two characters with spiky hair, one of them damn well better have yellow hair, like blonde hair. And if you have another one with spiky hair, he better have black hair. And if you got to have a third guy with hair, big hair, like say Sephiroth, well, let's just say he better have like white hair or something totally different. Uh, so I wanted to dig real quickly into the color image. Now this was done after they didn't do this during development. This was done after the fact. And I can say that with some certainty because most concept art didn't need to be in color at the time. And in fact, in 1997, 1998, it wasn't even a common practice to be using Photoshop, for example, for concept art. In fact, a lot of times the character designer was just another artist on the team. And in fact, Nomura had designed a lot of the pixel art. He had done a lot of pixel art on the previous, on Final Fantasy VI, which is where he actually got his start. He came in halfway through development on that. And so this was all kind of new. And then of course, over the course of 97 to the next few years, everything transitioned into digital. In terms of color, what we have here is a nice, nice balance. You know, we've got uh, skin tones up in the top half. Everything below is pretty plain and almost flat drab blue. This works well because in contrast to the rest of your party, nobody else is wearing these colors. 
And you always want to be aware of how your character looks in the lineup of the main playable characters. Make sure that each one has a unique identifiable element. Even if it's a plain element, it's distinctly different from the other characters. This is one of my gripes about Final Fantasy 16 of what I've seen of it so far. They're all sitting around this like circle and they're all wearing pretty much exactly the same looking armor. Now, when does one need a, a, an anime headshot? <laughs> Because I kind of bust on this all the time. Don't put stuff like this in your portfolio if you're a character designer. This may have flown in the 1990s. It does not fly today unless if your character has such a unique element. Now, when we're talking Cloud Strife, he had a really freaking unique element. This is the thing. This is the haircut that rocked the world. Okay. Not necessarily was it so original. Okay. But it was the first time we had seen this in a video game character. We had seen it in anime. We had seen it in manga, but we had not seen it in a video game. And so you had to figure out how is, how can this even be built? And so some modeler is sitting here trying to figure out how to assemble the polygons to make this dynamic looking shape work. Like how, do you get these shapes? You have to be able to assemble it. And in order to assemble such a design, some, some concept artists had to sit down and actually work out the close-up headshot to explain the confusing hairstyle. Otherwise, it's going to look very strange and the, the modeler isn't going to be able to understand what the heck to do with it unless they themselves are very creative and just kind of like sync up really well with the, the concept artist. Another example of when you would need a headshot like this is, of course, if you've got something really unique, like in this case, he's supposed to have Mako infused eyes. So when there is a unique identifiable characteristic, such as extra glowing eyes or specific color of a character's eyes, that's when you need a portrait of how they look close up. I think if it's specifically important to that story, it would be valuable to actually drop a note here, you know, right, actually write something on your concept or image that says, hey, you know, his eyes are infused with Mako, so they glow extra bright, you know, something like that. But oftentimes concept artists just go, oh no, I just wanted to do like a close up of, of the character. And then they never actually design the rest of the character. They just have like 20 pages of headshots of characters that already exist. Uh, for fear of going on forever about uh, just Cloud, I'm going to kind of move on to some of the other characters. Shots like this are, are important when you're doing character design. It shows like how the character may uh, store their sword. You know, uh, it looks like he has a buckle on his back, which I think is important. Oftentimes concept artists and character designers won't take the time to add the details to show, for example, like why these straps, like how are they connecting in the back? Although this is labeled as an early concept design, I think that some of the elements here did really stick. And uh, I mean, certainly it was the early stages of establishing that haircut. I have to wonder if maybe the haircut actually came from the back view of just needing a unique silhouette for the character. Oftentimes with these older generation games, when you're designing a character for something that's low poly or low level of detail, oftentimes you do end up where you're, you're more searching for a unique silhouette than anything else. Um, but uh, if you're doing character design, it's so essential that you have your back views. And I think it's very clear here that, uh, you know, Nomura was trying to figure out how the heck is this hair even going to work, you know? Um, but uh, it's it's clearly like, you know, an early stage for the Cloud Strife design. And it does give us a little bit more insight into like, you know, the leather strap and how it fits underneath the uh, pauldron, you know, and the assembly with the, uh, you can see the actual, let me zoom in here. You can see the actual uh, hooks uh, where the straps will actually hook onto to his belt. I do feel like his pants, his belt is like, it sets kind of maybe a little bit too high, don't you think? But uh, I'm not here to criticize. I'm just here to point out nifty information. Okay, so moving on, I wanted to talk about a couple of the other characters. We've got Tifa. Tifa has a very unique and identifiable look. Uh, specifically, I, this, this looks like some half finished doodles. I mean, something like this ain't going to fly. It ain't going to fly in your portfolio. It ain't going to fly in a game development environment, even though sometimes you just don't have time to really work out your design. And uh, back then they didn't really usually have much more than 18 months to develop a game. So oftentimes you do end up with a lot of these kind of half finished sketches and things like that. 
So what we can see here is that there's a consistency with the uh, the elbow pad. It kind of looks a little bit like Cloud's uh, pauldron that he's got. And also uh, when we're looking at like how a lot of the characters are wearing gloves. Now her whole thing is that she punches and kicks. She's more of like a martial artist almost. And so she's got to have a sporty look to her. And I think they really amplified that when they did the redesign. Specifically, if we look at like how her leggings kind of go up a little bit more. She's also got a little bit more of a, it's not as much of a skirt as it is like a shorts kind of a, a design uh, going with it. They've modernized it so that the belt buckle isn't just like hanging loose like this. But she has a very distinct hairstyle from Aerith, for instance, the other female lead in, in the game. And also even her body type she and, and her expressions kind of showcase that she has a very different personality. So uh, the one of the most important things you want to pay attention to when you're doing an entire cast of characters is that you want for them to look very distinct from each other in terms of personality too and, and how they're carrying themselves. So Aerith would never stand in the same way that, for instance, Tifa would stand. Even when we're looking at the color version, we see that there's a kind of a uniqueness to her color scheme. So she is showing a lot more skin tone, uh, but also uh, she has uh, black hair. And remember what I was saying earlier about... Uh, especially in the old days, if you have two female characters in your squad of seven uh, heroes or whatever, uh, make sure that they don't have the same color hair and the same shape in their hairstyles. It's, they should be distinctly unique and have a unique silhouette and also have a unique color to them. And this is why you started to get characters like Terra that had a uh, green hair in, in uh, one of the previous Final Fantasies as well. And so uh, when we're looking at the colors, none of the other characters use this color combination of the uh, white uh, top with the black and red uh, combination, you know, especially with the black hair. So she has a unique and distinct look in the lineup amongst the other characters. In fact, probably the closest comparison would be Yuffie, but Yuffie is obviously, she's much shorter. She has this very distinct, unique, different weapon from everybody else. And this long sleeve arm. Now, one thing that I do really appreciate about Nomura's design sense is his love of asymmetry. And he does incorporate it in everything he does, even though I do find that he repeats himself a lot, you know, with things like these elements. Uh, maybe that's part of what brings the, all of the characters uniquely uh, together into the same world, you know, but she's got these leg warmers on. Yuffie clearly has a little bit more of a ninja kind of uh, a styling with the headband. Look at her expression. I don't, I don't, okay, I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I don't want to pick on any of the artwork here. I want to look at the design itself because the design itself is really interesting and unique and strong. When we talk about like how parts are fitting together, I mean, look at this, you know, the care put into like how the leather straps fit to cut to cover her arm and protect her from the metal that she needs because when she's throwing this massive blade she's going to need something to possibly deflect or block or, and, and this is just such a unique weird looking design there's i challenge you to find me something else that looks like that and and, and if you do please do send it to me because I'm very curious. I've never seen anything. I thought it was weird looking when I was looking at it in the remake. And then I'm looking at the concept art now from back in the 90s. And it's like, wow, it's it was weird looking back then, too. But they translated it well. It is strange that uh, she's got her pants open. Like, I guess that shows a kind of a laziness. Um, but the, the turtleneck sweater, I've always had an affinity for turtleneck sweaters ever since... <laughs> Ever since I I used to own a few of them, uh, but anyway, uh, getting back to the, the the character design itself, I, this isn't about this isn't about my fashion sense in the '90s uh, or the early 2000s. This is about the Final Fantasy character designs, and I'll tell you what, man, she does have a unique look. Part of what makes her her look so unique is that asymmetry. You've got uh, almost like look at this. So she's got the leather strapping that holds on this big arm piece all on this side. She's got the, the leather strapping across her legs, which I don't know what function they serve. I can't think of any function for this, but it is distinctly unique to Yuffie. Nobody else has that. Uh, and then, of course, the stockings down the leg and then tying it together on the other arm over here. So while I may not be able to appreciate Nomura's rendering ability at the time, which, hey, to be fair, 
I couldn't render as well in the 90s either, uh, you know, uh, so I, I get it, you know, and I certainly, you know, he, maybe he even feels the same way, like, hey, I don't want to look at my old art, but I'll tell you what, the design sense was pretty good, to like just the overall idea behind what made each character unique in a lineup, and now a lot of times the director or the, 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 the writer for the game will have a lot of influence on these things as well. So we cannot always just go, oh yeah, it was that one guy. It's like, there are a lot of people involved in the process of designing the character and what function they serve in the game. So we can't put it all on Nomura, but I'll tell you what, whoever came up with that for this character, I mean, the asymmetry also communicates a kind of disorder disorderly lifestyle. It, it communicates that you're not like part of, I guess you'd say like a uniform uh, consistency. It's like a deviant, uh, somebody who is um, maybe on the outside of things, which is exactly what Yuffie is. And I won't go into her story, just just play the game, especially the Integrade episode. Uh, so I'm just going to cover a couple more things. Sid is probably, let's say probably the most plain. And he's also, because he's the most plain, he's also generally not really one of the most popular. Um, but his design does communicate a few things. Now, he's an airship pilot, so obviously we've got the goggles, right? He's blonde-haired. He's got spiky hair, but guess what? It's short. It's cut much shorter. He's smoking a cig. He's an older guy. He's got the old flight jacket on. And everybody, I wonder if when Nomura is old, is he going to pull his belt buckle up way too high like over his belly button and because what how is this his crotch how is that i'm trying to figure out where his body his body is like here and then torso and then is are, are is this his, his hips i guess technically maybe he just likes you know what i think it is i think he just likes having all of his characters with really long legs Maybe because he was so stifled by the uh, the chibi style that he, he felt he had to really amplify the opposite to break free from it. Anyway, this isn't about that. Um, there's some consistencies with the, the world by, again, having everybody wearing gloves. Uh, he's wearing a flight jacket, which kind of communicates and supports that whole thing about him being a pilot. He has a uh, kind of a, a, a sort of an ascot that gives him a level of sophistication, one might say. Uh, and so, uh, you know, fairly plain blue, boots too, blutes. Plain blutes is, is what makes Sid. And, and, and I'm sorry if Sid is your favorite character. I can't understand it. Because to me, Sid is the guy you put in there that makes everybody else look more interesting. Sid is the guy who I benched for the almost entirety of the game. He was like a level 12 when everybody else was a 99, uh, except for also Kate Sith. Also, <laughs> this isn't about my favorite Final Fantasy characters. Let's move on. Uh, Sid, again, a oh, pack of smokes in, in the headband. Okay. All right. All right. He's, he's, uh, he's got, he does have a unique element. We are not going to talk about Wedge and we are not going to talk about Biggs. I'm sorry, that's just, they're not even going to make the cut. Barrett, however, does deserve some talking about. Barrett is one very unique and interesting for his time. Let me pull up a color image. Watching Barrett on screen was the first time I'd ever seen a video game character cuss. <laughs> and for some reason, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I think because I was uh, 19, 20 years old, and I thought, video games are really growing up, even though when you look at this design, I mean, it's goofy as all get out. Okay. Um, but look at, look at it this way, very distinctly unique from every other character, especially Sid. Okay. Gun for an arm. Obviously this is a character who's overloaded with unique characteristics, even though he's still just wearing like plain old green pants. Dude's got a freaking gun for an arm. And they never let you forget it either. Uh, he's also, he's black and he's built like a tank. This is like, he stands out in the lineup as distinctly unique. Also, he does talk, he does use a lot of profanity. <laughs> so even the way the character is written, 
uh, has a distinctly unique look. Again, though, look at these proportions. This is his, that's his pelvis. This is his chest. You know what? I'm jealous. I This looks like so much fun. I think Nomura had the most fun any concept artist has ever had making video games. He got to draw just ridiculously outlandish craziness and they made sense out of it. Um, and and I, I, if, if anything that I say sounds like I'm being critical of Nomura, it is because I am so jealous of what he has gotten to do. Uh, I could draw characters like this all day, every day, nonstop, forever. And if anybody out there wants to make 16-bit or PS1 level you know, RPGs out of them, I will provide all of the character <laughs> designs for you. Because this is just fun. This makes you want to draw. This stuff made me want to draw in my notebook. Everything down to like the characters' shapes of their heads, the kind of expressions that they would use. Nobody else in all of Midgar looks like Barrett looks. All the way down to the tattoos, which by the way, uh, if you know much about Japanese culture, this is unique because you know, having a character with a tattoo implies that you're part of like a Yakuza or a gang. So in some ways, like Barrett is one of the most edgy characters. I hate that term, but he's one of the most like fringe kind of outsiders, badasses uh, in all of gaming. Uh, and he remains that even as they updated him into the new design. Now, the things that uh, I think didn't work, uh, obviously like, you know, Nomura just doesn't put enough care into boots or shoes. And now I don't want to go off on this because it's a bit of a tangent, but uh, they're also like you, he put all this time and care into designing the, the motorcycle parts, but Barrett's arm cannon is just a cylinder with some more smaller cylinders on the end. Like this could have been, and I, and I do believe that they improved it. I would, I would love to do a redesign of all these characters, by the way. Um, but like, you know, there are a number of ways that you could have like integrated this or added a more, more unique silhouette, you know, but I, I mean, the character does get different upgrades throughout the game as well. There are also, by the way, I do want to point out some similarities uh, to other characters. So we have these uh, metal bands going throughout the character. This is very similar to what we saw on Tifa. This is what we saw on um, uh, Cloud, obviously. Uh, so it does tie it to the rest of the, the world, again, with the gloves. Fingerless, though, because Barrett's the outsider. He's the brawler, right? Also, subtlety. Most people don't notice. Dog tags. Was Barrett former military? I don't know of any fiction. I don't know of any like novel novelization. I would love to read a, a series uh, going into the backstory on a lot of the characters of Final Fantasy VII. If you know of anything like that out there, please do drop that in the comments below because I love this stuff, obviously. I still go back and play the original, by the way. And yes, I do have that like maxed out Omega Weapon version where I killed all the Omega weapons and all that stuff. I got the level 99 stuff with all the materia. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did all that stuff back in the day. I'm a big fan of Final Fantasy VII, um, and I'm really looking forward to the new one, obviously. Again, I'm, I, I, I got to be careful because I, I geek out on this stuff. I truly love it. If you can't tell, I truly do love uh, uh, the Final Fantasy VII world. And uh, so obviously, <laughs> I'm going to geek out a little bit as I'm talking about these things. Okay, so Vincent. Uh, right out of the gate, Vincent, you can see, is really unique. Um, so he does have this very distinctive vampire vibe. Nobody else has the, the the red cloak, although he does get dangerously close to Tifa's color scheme. Do you notice that? He's got the black hair. Tifa has the black hair. Uh, he's got the uh, black clothes. Also, Tifa has the black clothes. If Vincent decided to wear shorts one day, he would be confused with Tifa, okay? Maybe if he wore like a white top. <laughs> uh, okay, also, a couple other things. So he has the very pointy shoes. Uh, this is a distinct aspect of the character. Everybody else has big clod hopping construction worker boots. Uh-uh, not Vincent. He's too sleek for that stuff. He wants to jump from rooftop to rooftop. He's got a giant metal gold arm with claws dudes freaking claw that's like the worst claw 
freaking claws. So this drives home his uh, dangerous, uh, threatening look looking aspect. I do again, you know, I want to I want to point out, uh, you know, maybe because it was PS1 era, uh, Nomura didn't feel that he needed to work out the design of this, but like, you know, a little bit more detail worked into like how this metal like if this was more filigree and more designy, I think it would have stood out as more interesting. I don't know why it kind of feels like that particular arm, the mechanical arm here, feels like it's a little bit called in, if you know what I mean. Um, and then, but there are some neat things going on here. I think one, again, obviously the, the distinct red cloak really makes him unique with the belt buckles kind of hanging off of the side of it and then going up over half of his face. I think that that gives him a mysterious look. This is something, a technique that you could use in your own characters. If you want to make characters feel unique uh, or uniquely kind of dark or mysterious, have the cloak that goes up and covers half of their eyes or have uh, a hood that covers most of their head. Something like that usually, like in almost every case, gives the character a very mysterious kind of a look. And this character is meant to be mysterious. He's not even a regular, you could play the whole game and not even get Vincent. He's he's an optional character. Um, also, just regular old gun. It's just a guy holding a regular old gun. But that does tell you something about that world. It's a world that does have some familiar elements to our own world, um, you know. And also, it's so it's not so steampunk that it's unrelatable. I guess you'd say. I want to talk briefly about Red, uh, Red 13. Uh, Red 13 is uh, very distinctly unique. I think this is awesome to see this, by the way. And what we don't know, what most people don't know, is that almost every character design that goes into a game has iterations that you'll never see. Uh, the company will never release the unused sketches of, for instance, half of the Demon Hunter designs that we did or the Monk or any of the other characters that we did for Diablo 3. Uh, you know, you'll just, you'll never see a lot of the, the scrapped character designs that we worked on for League of Legends, for example. And uh, so this is kind of rare and unique that you would get to see this. I don't know if maybe this is hit an alternate or if this was him as a cub, or maybe it is his cub. Maybe there was an, a sideline side story you know, uh, involving him rescuing his, his cub or something like that. What does work for this really well, one, he, he does have the cloud strife hair, but guess what? It's all red. It's all like a, a singular uh, color scheme. And also he's not humanoid. So he's so distinctly different that he's allowed to have the cloud strife hair. He's the only guy who's allowed to have the, the cloud strife hair uh, because he's not even human. He's not going to be confused with him when they're standing in a lineup. Um, some things that really made him unique and, and stand apart. The Indian style feathers, I think nice touch gives it like a, uh, an immediate kind of an association is that uh, he might be from some kind of like a tribe. He might be from some kind of a, a mystical tribe. And especially when you find out more about where he is from, uh, it's, it, it's like, oh, I want to go there. I want to see more of these guys. I want to find out more about what they're like because he is a talking animal, <laughs> basically. And the way that they made him unique was to give him armbands, which are not very well worked out. There's not a lot of detail there. And um, it's a little bit surprising that there's just no, uh, you know, no actual pattern work worked out. Like, it's almost like he just sketched out a the the body of it and then didn't didn't bother to figure out the the details of what the actual pieces look like but again we're talking about PS1 era and this had to be worked out by the time you get to you know translating it to PlayStation 4 PlayStation 5 I am a little bit surprised I would have thought to put something on the tail to give it a unique look or you know possibly do something with, uh, you know, the fur along the back to give him like a little bit more of spikes, but that does make him look more feral. And uh, the things that make him look a little bit more intelligent and possibly like it's believable that he's a talking animal are things like having the braids. Uh, this kind of implies a sophistication that animals don't usually have. So he's either a pet. If we didn't know, we could make the assumption that he is either a pet or he is uh, part of a slightly more sophisticated tribe of animals especially if we see the character speaking for example ah here we go okay so there was there was a drawing a color drawing of red that had a little bit more detail going on in some of the design and we've got some really nice details going on in the in the plates here again though would have to be translated would have to be updated for 
uh, you know, the modern generation of video game consoles. The tattoos also, by the way, the tattoos also imply a lot about a kind of a culture that, that this isn't just an animal. This is an animal that has a culture and uh, something that final fantasy does very well is they create like armor sets for Moogles and they create like actual clothing and things for these anthropomorphic animal type of characters. And that gives them a, it's such an incredible uh, uh, kind of a, a sense of being alive. You know, the fact that they would take the time to braid and, and make headdresses and things out of the feathers uh, from their natural environment. So the last character that I wanted to talk about is Aerith. And yes, I, I'm intentionally leaving, leaving out Kate Sith because there's nothing to say about Kate Sith. <laughs> I'm just not even going to talk about it. Uh, okay, so Aerith, though, uh, great character design for what she is. Now we've got the, again, the crotch too high up. Her legs are too long, brah, but we don't care because she's not necessarily a fighter and her demeanor, the way she stands, the way that she dresses also supports that she is not a fighter. She is a flower girl who happens to have the power of these ancient uh, 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 creatures, these ancient people, and she can speak to spirits, okay? So that's exactly what this communicates. She's not going to be rushing into battle. She's not going to be right next to Barrett. She's going to be standing in the back casting spells, and that is exactly what she communicates. The, uh, the Mako in her eyes, the color of her eyes communicate that. The kindness, the kind look in her eyes uh, also communicates that her hairstyle is uniquely distinctly uh, I guess you'd say wholesome she doesn't seem like she doesn't have like a shaved head on the side or anything that makes her seem edgy or punkish she doesn't seem like uh, somebody who's a threat in combat and I think that that's a very important aspect of her character I do think that possibly they could have steered away from the traditional pink and red uh, to just kind of, you know, because they're, ooh, they're girly colors or something. But it was also 1997. So like, you know, I'm cutting them some slack for that. Uh, giving her the bow staff weapons, I think uh, these are almost like mage staffs, actually. Uh, she doesn't even really hit people with them. She just uses them to cast spells. And I think that that gives her a unique aspect uh, when she's in the lineup with the rest of the characters as well. Personally, I probably, probably would have done something different for the feet. Um, these are all big clod hopper boots and what they did in the updated version in the remake is they just, they gave the women just a little bit more of a form fitting shoes. They're more normal human sized shoes. But <laughs> back in the day, I think this had to do with that chibi style. They had to, they had to amplify the proportions and make them consistent across all the characters, not just a couple of characters. Um, but, uh, I do think that like, it isn't, it's a plain design. And, and one of the things that Nomura does, and we can at least, because this is a character design toolkit, we can, and we can analyze this aspect of something Nomura does. This whole area, there's like a, about a third of every character that is really plain. It's just like flat cloth. And then the, all the interesting stuff is happening in the upper torso. And if you keep that in mind when you're doing your character design, what it'll do is it'll force the viewer to always look at the more interesting part of the body because it's contrasted with these large plane areas. And this is something that we can take away from Nomura's design sense, something that we can evaluate and go, well, maybe, you know what? Maybe the boots aren't really all that important, you know? Um, maybe maybe all the important stuff is what's going on in the upper body or in whether or not the character is asymmetrical or whether or not there's, you know, a, a consistency of parts like the metal bands on all the characters wrists, you know, for example. And furthermore, I want to talk, you know, I, I've mentioned uh, that, that he likes to do this asymmetrical thing. Notice that Aerith is completely symmetrical. There's, there's subtlety in this, but it's also because of what she represents in the story. Aerith is harmony. Aerith is, uh, it's, it's 
a kind of what she represents is a kind of harmony with the nature, a kind of harmony with the earth. Uh, and, and I know this sounds weird, but it, it ties into the universe and the story of what her people represent. She's part of this race and a descendant of these ancients that were people who spoke to the earth and the spirits of the earth. And so she needs to have a kind of symmetry and a kind of order and a kind of purity that say, for instance, Tifa doesn't have, you know, Tifa is a little bit more of a survivor in the, in the world. She's a human survivor. So she has to be a fighter. Whereas Aerith is someone who speaks to the earth, somebody who has a kind of, um, I guess you'd say that, like I said, a harmony. And that's something that tears at cloud. You know, there is a love triangle that goes on, by the way. <laughs> it's something that tears at cloud because he absolutely is in love with order, but he belongs in the chaos. He's a survivor like Tifa. He grew up with her. And so they're the same. Now, you may think as I'm talking about these things that they're not relevant to the character design or the way that they look, but I think they're absolutely essential to the character design. I think that story is what dictates good character design. And you'll see that as I do more of these videos, you'll see that the things that I appreciate the most are when the character designer really supported the character's design, what the intention was. And if it's a story-based game where drama is the focus of the progression, then the character designs are gonna reflect what they represent in that world, whether it's order or chaos, or whether it's uni unity or uniformity, or whether it's rebellion, you know, uh, all of these things and, and what every one of these characters represents is a distinct aspect of the story itself. And the overall uh, lineup of these characters, when you look at them, when you look at them after you've, you've followed the story, you feel, you can't help but feel something for each of them. And and their personality is reflected consistently with how they're designed. And I have no greater pet peeve in character design than when you tell me that a character is something that they don't look like at all. Final Fantasy VII masterfully captures what each character represents, both as a functional, playable character and as a narrative storytelling device. So that's it for me on this video. I hope that you enjoyed this analysis. I would love to hear your thoughts as well on the character design of Final Fantasy VII from the original to the remake. Uh, I know I enjoyed the game an awful lot. I'd love to know which game specifically uh, you'd like for me to do a character design breakdown for uh, in the future. I, I do enjoy doing this sort of a thing. If you should find that you have a more serious interest in becoming a character designer working in video games, well, I've created workshops and these are in-depth three-hour workshops with videos explaining all of my tips and techniques and tricks and exactly what is expected of a concept artist working in such a capacity. And I have all those available on my Gumroad channel, which you can find a link to on the screen and below the video. And of course, if you're new to the channel, I'm here every Wednesday. So if you have any questions about being a concept artist or making a living off of your art, please drop those in the comments below the video. And until next time, I'll catch y'all. Man, ya de bon. That's every Wednesday and sometimes more. Until then, and ciao, baby. Oh, yeah.